uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this session, which is about reaching the last offline mile. Uh, it was open to different uh, technologies. We have gotten mostly uh, mobile implementations. And, and we are gonna have, it's a long session, it's two hours. Uh, so, and we don't have many abstracts. We wanted to have time for each one of them. So we are gonna have four presenters. The first three are projects that actually have implemented mobile solutions for different use cases. We have a client level electronic data management project will be the first one. Uh, then we will have an offline data collection system in a field humanitarian hospital in South Sudan will be the second. And the third one will be um, a system, I, I, yeah, system for helping in child vaccination uptake in Yemen with mobile uh, solutions. And then we will close with a presentation uh, from uh, to share the experience from, um, I'm trying not to introduce the presenters now, but uh, from Chase. Uh, <laughs> uh, he has been supporting many implementations, many mobile implementations, and we thought it was a good wrap up to share key takeaways or challenges and open the discussion for the audience. So, um, so every session will take 15 to every abstract, 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will open for questions for each uh, right after. So I think we can go straight with the first one. The, our presenter is Rachel Limo. Let me know if that's not correct, Rachel. Senior Technical Advisor in FHI 360. So Rachel, I think I'm gonna pass it over to you. Uh, I don't know if the screen that we are seeing is already hers, Max? Yes, so if you wanna share your screen or put in presentation mode and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope Oslo is treating everyone so well so far. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Rachel Limo, I'm FHI 360 uh, Liberia, and I am the Senior Technical Advisor for Strategic Information, working specifically with the EPIC project. So uh, while I, I'll be presenting offline, I just want to quickly uh, acknowledge the presence of my FHI colleagues who are attending the conference physically and who are the leaders of the FHI 360 SI work, strategic information work, who are all behind the work that I'm going to present today. Uh, Ami uh, Godlip, who is our SI technical director from FHI 360 Washington, DC. Kyla, who is also a co-author for this abstract. And also uh, Gordon Parola, who is our uh, SI lead for data systems design and development. And we also have uh, in attendance physically a colleague from the Ministry of Health Liberia, Mr. Patrick Conlo, uh, and others whom we are also working on the ground to implement the uh, DHIS2 work. So Rachel, one sec. are there any of these uh, colleagues in the room? Yes. Hello? Yes. Maybe they have not joined yet. I'm, I'm asking the audience, are you here? No, okay. We will ask later during the questions. It is, we are opening the session, so maybe they come a bit later. Okay, thank you, Rachel, you can continue. Thank you. Oh. So uh, I am so honored to be part of this year's uh, DHIS2 annual conference. And I will be speaking about our DHIS2 work in the HIV programming here in Liberia. And specifically, uh, we'll be presenting uh, on an abstract titled, First Time Successful Implementation of a Client Level Electronic Data Management System in Liberia HIV program using the DHIS2 tracker. And I will also be sharing how this implementation is helping us as a country in reaching the last miles of the HIV treatment cascade. So, Rachel, uh, Rachel can yes. I 
interrupt you a second. Do you wanna change your view? We are seeing your presenter notes. So if you go to the top bar of the screen where the display settings in your own screen. Yeah, I am actually displaying, uh, is it not showing a presentation mode yet? It was, but we were seeing your, your, your screen, your notes. Do you want to go to this uh, presentation mode again? Okay. Because is that down on the bottom right corner? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually uh, doing that. Is it? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. That is was... it showing now? Okay. Maybe we have a bit of delay. I think it's loading. Yeah, because. No. Uh, I start so okay and now if you go to the top it says display settings oh. okay just uh, do it um, just to present as it comes yeah because I'm using two screens here and both are showing a uh, presentation mode What about that? Not yet. Hello. I think it's loading oh. based on the little delay icon. We are seeing a screen with a slide that says Liberia country profile. Yes, that's what so I'm You can take it from there, I think it's fine. All right. So yes, uh, I am currently presenting on the Liberia country profile. And for those of you who do not know, uh, Liberia is located on the west coast of the African continent. Uh, with a population size of about 4,6,050,676 uh, individuals. We have uh, 15 counties, 94 health districts, and 994 health facilities. The EPIC project uh, that is implementing this DHI to uh, tracker work is a five-year USID and FEFA funded uh, global cooperative agreement, which uh, is dedicated to complement the efforts of the government of Liberia in achieving and maintaining HIV epidemic control. Uh, EPIC project started in uh, October, 2020 and it is being implemented in 21 uh, PEPFA supported facilities. And Rachel, please go ahead, but we are gonna share our screen. Your, your screen is frozen for some reason. Oh, but yeah. just, just tell me when you wanna go to the next slide and I'll do that for you here. All right. But so we need you to stop sharing. Okay, okay. Thank you and, and sorry about that. No problem. Okay, you can continue, Rachel. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I was saying that uh, the EPIC uh, project is being implemented in 21 PEPFAR supported facilities. And these health facilities, the 21 facilities represent about 70% of the total PLHIV who are current on treatment uh, in Liberia. And uh, EPIC project, uh, is also uh, implementing COVID clinical care and vaccine response programs along with the HIV program. Next slide. 
So uh, the diagram that you're seeing uh, represents key data sources uh, that are feeding into the Envision Liberia Health Information System. And if you look at the bottom uh, side, the last but one is the electronic medical record, uh, which is the data source that the FHI 360 EPIC project is feeding into with the work that we are doing with the DHIS2. Next slide. So as indicated uh, earlier, I am going to present uh, an abstract, which is titled First Time Successful Implementation of a Client Level Electronic Data Management System in Liberia HIV Program Using the DHIS2 Tracker. Next slide. So by the way of uh, background, uh, it is estimated that uh, 35,000 individuals are living with HIV in Liberia and only 23,000 are on uh, antiretroviral therapy. And this is about 66% uh, of the second 95 uh, PEFA target, which means uh, as a country, we are lagging behind for about 29% to reaching the second 95. So in order to close this treatment gap and be able to reach the last mile, we need quality data that will be used to inform decision making uh, and improve service delivery and also improve uh, performance. However, uh, before this implementation, before rolling out the DHI school tracker, the 21 health facilities that FHI 360 is supporting were still relying on the fragmented paper-based system to collect and report the HIV uh, program data. And these fragmented paper systems were characterized by poor documentation, poor filing and storage systems, which made uh, retrieval of clients' charts difficult. And at times, providers were using random plain papers, notebooks, and other uh, documents to uh, document client services. And this fragmented paper-based system also led to uncoordinated provider and sometimes peer-led ART dispensing to clients' homes without documentation or without uh, being registered. And these uh, practices led to poor quality of data and it was difficult to uh, do any granular data analysis that can inform the program and also help improve the services that were being provided. So with these challenges in September, 2021, uh, USID through uh, funding from PEFA to FHI 360 EPIC project in collaboration with the National AIDS Control Program and the uh, Ministry of Health decided to then implement the uh, district health information software, which is the DHI to track our client level data system to be able to record and report the HIV program data. Next slide. So in our implementation, we use the EPIS framework, which is the exploratory, preparatory implementation and sustainment framework. During the uh, exploratory stage, we conducted needs assessment, uh, which enabled us to determine the availability of electricity, internet uh, coverage and connectivity, uh, availability of data entry staffs, uh, uh, estimating the client load, and also uh, uh, doing an assessment of the filing and storage systems. During that stage, we also conducted various engagement meetings with stakeholders from the Ministry of Health here in Liberia. We also uh, did uh, meetings with the National HIV uh, uh, program and also with the heads of these 21 health facilities that we are supporting so that we can build awareness on the data quality challenges and uh, brainstorm solutions together, ensure 
uh, there's buy-in, support, collaboration, and ownership. And also at the exploratory stage, we conducted uh, data quality assessment, especially uh, at the four of the high volume facilities that we were supporting so that we can determine the documentation gaps that will inform uh, our next steps. Uh, next, we moved to the preparatory stage where we recruit, uh, recruited data entry clerks uh, procured generators, uh, solar panels, client files, cabinets uh, for storage of files. We procured desktop computers, Android tablets, and internet devices for data entry. We also conducted trainings to data entry clerks uh, on DHIS2 and also uh, developed a data entry plan which classified our data into uh, our data and facilities into small, medium, and high volume. And we then conducted data cleaning exercise uh, in the four high volume facilities where we had to organize and update the fragmented paper records before we could transfer that records into the DHIS2 electronic system. During the implementation stage, uh, the data entry started uh, by transferring the records from the uh, standard paper source document into the DHIS2 system, as you can see uh, on the photo on the right hand side at the top, uh, we can see the data entry clerks there using uh, the yellow uh, client charts to transfer the records into the uh, electronic devices. And after we did enter the data into the electronic system, we then organized, filed, and stored those client charts using unique identifier codes. And then we uh, continued with uh, routine monitoring and support activities to ensure successful implementation. And the last stage was a sustainment stage where uh, currently we are working with the Ministry of Health here in Liberia to uh, support the migration of the data uh, from FHI 360 DHIS to cloud server to the MOH server. And this migration of the server to MOH uh, server will facilitate ownership and ensure that we have data integration and systems uh, interoperability as stipulated in the country HIS strategic plan, as you can see on the right hand side at the bottom. Next slide. After the implementation, after we successfully uh, transferred the records from the paper-based uh, records into the electronic systems, and as I highlighted before that we did a data quality assessment and then we did a data cleaning exercise to organize the paper records, then after that, we managed to uh, recount and also enter in the DHIS to track a 91% of the data that the project has reported uh, in the period of June 2022 from these uh, 21 health facilities. With the transition from the paper based to electronic system, the quality of data improved significantly, especially uh, in the four high volume facilities, which uh, the quality of data before the transition was 58%. And when we transitioned the data to electronic system, it improved from 58 to 90%. And uh, I will draw your attention to the right hand side. You will see there's uh, a table there with the four high volume facilities out of the 21 that we are supporting. And you will see there's uh, on the left side, there's the data quality during uh, the period where we were still using the paper-based system. And on the right side, you will see the data, the quality of data after we did uh, the data cleaning and transitioned the paper records uh, into the electronic DHIS2 tracker. And you will see how the individual facilities uh, improved uh, before and after in the overall, as I mentioned, uh, improved from 58% to 90%. And 
And with this improvement, then we learned that fragmented paper-based systems were and are a major factor for poor data quality, more especially in the high volume facilities where there's a huge number of uh, clients where you need to uh, collect uh, the information from, you need to manage the, the data, uh, you need to process it and to report it. We also uh, learned that uh, from this implementation that uh, for the implementation to be successful and sustainable, we require collaboration and coordination among various stakeholders. And also we need to continue providing close monitoring and support activities so that these systems can be sustainable. And as you can see on the right hand side, uh, we have photos there of the data entry plaques uh, doing the data entry uh, in the uh, electronic devices. But you also see also myself there and a colleague from the uh, National AIDS Control Program who we were working together to review the client charts and update them before we transfer the quality data into the electronic system. And we also learned that the success and the lessons that we learned from this implementation in the 21 uh, facilities that uh, FHI 360 is supporting uh, is being used by various stakeholders uh, here in Liberia to expand and improve their data systems as well. And currently, the National AIDS Control Program is using the same uh, model and also learning from uh, uh, FHI 360 experience so that they can also uh, use the same to expand to other non pepfar supported facilities. We are also working with other um, organizations and, and donors like DOD and Plan International to support uh, the data management system so that they can transition their data from paper-based to electronic system. Next uh, slide. So as I highlighted before, uh, with the transition from paper-based to electronic system, our data quality have uh, improved significantly. And with this improvement, we have been able to uh, retain clients on treatment. And if you look on the right-hand side, you will see there are two charts there showing the continuity of treatment uh, between two quarters, uh, Q2 of 2022 and Q2 of 2023. And in this waterfall analysis, if you pay attention to the red bars, uh, starting with the top uh, chart, we had uh, extreme losses on our project in this Q2 uh, of 2022 of about 3,000 individuals who, uh, uh, who, who had interruption in treatment. And we also had uh, 2,000 individuals who were transferred out. And mostly, uh, most importantly, we had about 3,000 plus individuals uh, which were an attributed gain. And this one was an issue of data quality, uh, especially for the unattributed gain. And for these losses, it was because uh, records were not properly uh, organized and um, classified. So after this, then we transferred the records into the electronic system and everything was clear. And we were able now to classify clients properly on their categories of whether active or inactive, whether uh, they were lost to pull up or if they were transferred out, etc. And you see now uh, with the chart at the bottom, uh, our data for Q2, in 2023, the data have uh, improved uh, significantly. The losses have gone down uh, significantly and also uh, the quality has uh, improved significantly. And this, uh, as I indicated, this quality and this improvement in service delivery is really helping in us uh, managing to reach the last miles in the HIV treatment cascade. Next slide, please. 
Again, uh, with the implementation of the DHIS2 tracker, the client level DHIS2 tracker in the 21 facilities that we are supporting, we are able to generate various dashboards and be able to make use of data to improve service delivery and also improve the performance and be able to reach the last miles in the treatment cascade. And for these two, you'll be able to see that we are able to track monthly the performance trends for HIV testing by sex and population type. And with this uh, disaggregations by sex and population types, the project is able to perform various granular data analysis and be able to come up with targeted uh, interventions for specific at-risk groups, uh, all of which are helping in reaching the last mile. Next slide, please. As a way of, uh, as a way forward, uh, we now continue to facilitate data analysis, visualization and use in the DHIS2 system that we have implemented so that we can be able to, uh, as I said, uh, perform granular data analysis that will be used for decision-making uh, and to help improve the service provision uh, at these health facilities and also be able to improve performance and that achieve uh, the PEPFAR 9595 targets and also in reaching the last miles. And we are also, uh, as I highlighted before, we are working with the Ministry of Health so that we can be able to uh, migrate the DHIS2 server from FHI uh, servers to the uh, M MOH server so that uh, we can facilitate ownership uh, and so that the MOH can use uh, that system to integrate it with other health systems and from other partners as well. And we are also continuing to support the Liberian Ministry of Health and other partners in improving their data management systems as I said, we are working with the National AIDS Control Program and other uh, donors and other implementing partners to support their uh, efforts to transition their data from paper-based to electronic systems so that we can ensure quality of data. Next slide. In, conc in conclusion, we uh, therefore uh, say that uh, the successful implementation of the DHIS2 system that FHI uh, and the EPIC project uh, has implemented in the 21 facilities in Liberia and the significant impact it has had in improving the quality of HIV AIDS data makes it a benchmark for further efforts to expand and improve data management systems in the country and also support in the efforts to reach the last mile in the HIV treatment cascade. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I will stop there and hand it over to the organizers. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rachel. So I think we have a some time for questions. Is there any question in the audience? Okay, we, have one. we have one question for you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, uh, for this uh, good presentation. So my question is about the challenges you met uh, during implementation of these uh, 20, 20, 21 uh, facilities so that we can plan for the, uh, the mitigation plan for the next uh, uh, expansion in the next uh, uh, remaining health facilities. That is one, and uh, maybe you can share experience about uh, the use of this tool in the remote areas where uh, there is a limited uh, internet connection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as I highlighted in my presentation, before the implementation of the DHIS2 electronic system, these facilities, these 21 facilities that we inherited from the government of Liberia were still relying 
on uh, fragmented paper-based systems. And these fragmented paper-based systems were characterized by poor documentation. And the poor documentation was the result of the fact that uh, the filing and storage systems were poor as well. So even when a client will visit a facility, retrieval of their client chart was difficult. So providers will just resort to uh, prescribing medication without documenting anywhere. And at some point it became more worse that they will even prescribe medication to clients without being registered. And when EPIC, uh, and, uh, I mean, FHI 360 EPIC project uh, inherited these 21 facilities, then we had to uh, do an assessment to determine uh, these gaps, like the documentation gap, and see to what extent uh, documentation is not being done in these health facilities. And after seeing uh, the, the gaps, then we had to do a data cleaning exercise. And this one, we had to review one chart after the other, one uh, unique identifier code after the other, and know whether they are active or inactive by pulling from various sources, from various pieces of paper, from notebooks, from uh, dispensing, uh, uh, from dispen dispensing forms and registers, and then gather these small, small pieces and update in one standard source document, which is the client chart. And after we managed to pull the information from the various scattered and fragmented uh, paper-based documents that were being used, we were able then to transfer the records that we updated into the electronic system. And to answer your second question about how we are managing with the remote areas of the country where it is difficult to have internet connectivity. Yes, we are experienced that we're experiencing that challenge as well. And what we are doing currently is uh, we are using uh, one application, uh, BlueStack. It's an Android app that you can uh, install it in your uh, computer and be able to enter data offline. And then when you are in a place or when you are at a time where you have internet connectivity, then you can upload your data. Though uh, that application comes with its challenges as well because it is an Android uh, mobile app. It takes a lot of space and sometimes data clerks will report that it, it, it becomes slow uh, and data entry becomes slow when you're using BlueStack, but that's how we are managing it at the time. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I think we would love to know more about that last part, but uh, we are gonna have to, to move on to the, to the next presenters. I wanna say that there are two questions in the chat that we don't have time to take, but are about the data quality processes and the, uh, management of the data entry clerk. So I encourage those of you making the questions to contact directly with Rachel through the platform. She is listed as a speaker and she can probably give you details about that. So with that, we are gonna move to our second um, abstract of the day. So we are gonna have Maria Jose Blanco, health medical officer in MSF Spain, sharing the experience of setting up an offline data collection system and analysis in a field hospital in South Sudan. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Yes, uh, so hi, my name is Maria Jose. I'm working in uh, MSF Spain, Médecins Saint Frontières, as a health medical officer, but also been in the, in the field for many years for being one of the final users of the uh, system for for a long time. Uh, so what we are going to present today is the use of mobile data collection offline system in one of the projects that uh, we, uh, we run uh, actually. I 
here, no? Yeah, it's okay. okay. Uh, so um, MSF Spain, Spain start using, um, develop a system, uh, health information management system in 2014. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, 2014 uh, adapted from the DHIS uh, tool. And in 2018, um, a diagnosis exercise uh, was conducted in order to um, um, discover a bit the challenges and the issues that the field teams had in relation with uh, data collection and analysis. So uh, in this exercise, uh, we realized that the main uh, the the main issues faced by the problem was related with data collection as a process that was perfect thank you uh, it was a repetitive process, time consuming, spending a lot of time uh, for the people that was in charge to, to collect this information in the different uh, services. And also prone to human uh, errors are they needed to do the total calculations for uh, different information that should be uh, introduced in the in the tally sheet first and then in uh, uh, in the system. So um, one of the solution that uh, was proposed was the use of um, offline mobile data collection through um, tablets in the different uh, services. So the solution was based in uh, the use of the DHAs as to Android app for data collection of individual registries, and then a custom web app that integrates these records into the, the system as uh, aggregate data. Additionally, it was a review the use of the existing registry book. Uh, to understand a bit how it uh, works usually in our projects uh, in relation to data, the process starts with the introduction of the information in the clinical file. Then this information is um, translated in a registry book in a linear manner with the information uh, for each patient. And then in a weekly basis, in most of the cases, and in some of them in a monthly basis, is translated into a tally sheet, uh, then into the uh, system through the uh, data entry. And finally, the information is storage in the, in the system. As you can see, the first three, uh, three steps are done in, uh, in paper uh, inside the, the facility. Um, the provided solution um, facilitate the data flow of this process. So uh, skipping through of the uh, steps until uh, the storage in the system. So we go from the clinical file to the registry book, and then introducing directly the information in a tablet. This tablet aggregate the information and storage the data directly in the system. So uh, we facilitate and make easy uh, this process. Uh, this project uh, was uh, piloted and conducted in uh, the mission that uh, we have in South Sudan. This is a long-term mission that was established in 2013, um, very soon after the civil war uh, broke down in 2011. And to have an idea about the situation in the country since that moment up to now, uh, we have more than 400,000 people that has been killed. Um, more than 2 million people uh, had fled to, to other countries, and we face more than 1.8 million people that has been displaced inside the, the country. It's true that in 2018, 2019, there was um, some uh, peace agreement that improved the situation, 
but still there are many people that still languish in different um, in different camps where the access to um, health, primary health care and secondary health care is still very poor. Um, additionally, we need to consider interethnic uh, clashes and uh, other problems in the in the communities. So the situation is still uh, not stable in 100%, uh, let's, let's say. So still adapting every day, every week to, to the uh, situation in the, in the place. The project that you are seeing here, these photos are in Malakal, that is the capital of the Upper Nile state, close to the border with uh, Sudan in the north uh, east part of the, of the country. So we work in, in the community, but also we have activities in two hospitals, one of them the POC inside the camp and also in the Malakal town. The system was established in seven of the services. Nowadays, it's still running in five. Um, two of the, the services were closed related to the operational uh, decisions. So to start the, pro the project, um, it has been started with two weeks work uh, in the with trainings in the services, uh, directly with the people that was going to be in charge for data collection. That was mainly the nurses supervisors that are uh, local hire staff, and it was these colleagues that had uh, was in charge for for data collection. Um, after those, the, there was an evaluation to assess uh, how it works, the, the mobile uh, data collection in, this, uh, in these services. So during the, the evaluation, um, uh, the, the results were that this mobile technology to support data collection was feasible and was well accepted for the people working in the, in the services and for the person in, in charge. Uh, one of the of the main advantages uh, was related with the efficiency, as this automatic aggregation of data was saving many many time for the people that was spending hours every week at the beginning of every week collecting this information from the different registry books in the in the services. Uh, so the data collection process improved. Um, also, there was um, uh, a good uh, feedback from the users related with the time and the completeness of data was not uh, changed so much. Also, one of the, um, uh, the improvements uh, related to this system was the improving the data quality and data, data accuracy. Uh, that was uh, the feedback given by the, by the, the users. Um, so in general, uh, since the moment that has been implemented and through the years that we are using this system, uh, we can say that it was introduced without major problems uh, and that was really well accepted by the users. Because we need to think that from a public health perspective, one time is the assessment that you do during at the final of the pilot, but then it's also the acceptance and the use through all these years that was uh, very positive. Um, however, to be realistic, we need to <laughs> take into consideration some challenges um, that change a bit in nature from the starting of the pilot up to now. It's true that at the beginning, um, most of the challenges and the issues were more related uh, with uh, technical problems. Um, uh, mainly with the remote support. We need to think that we work in places where uh, connectivity is very poor. Uh, sometimes not just connectivity, but even the access to electricity. So it's one of the, the challenges that, that we face. Also, there were some identifications of the synchronization errors in the Android app. And uh, also any time that the, there is an update in the health data model, we need to map in the project indicators and data elements. However, uh, those problems are decreasing through time, and we need to focus also in the problems and challenges related with the, with the context. In the way we work, uh, the, there is a high turnover of uh, managers that work in the projects, the one that should support also the, the local staff in these uh, activities, and also, one of the main challenges that we face is the high workload for supervisors. 
um, as there is a lot of competing priorities in their daily life and activities to face. So sometimes they don't have time to check, to introduce data, to exit patients in the patients in the in the system. Uh, so time to time we need to review a bit and and reinforce the training. Uh, as we were facing problems with access indicators and one of the key elements in the uh, key indicators in the use for uh, hospital management, that is the bed occupancy rate. Um, in this moment, uh, we would like also to implement this um, project in other services, uh, in other places also where the use of these tablets can be, uh, can have an add value to the different projects. So we were thinking perhaps also in remote settings where the electricity and connectivity is very poor in the way that they can introduce data in the tablets and then uh, synchronize later on. Also for outreach activities, uh, avoiding this uh, daily uh, work of uh, introducing data in a tally sheet or even in facilities with a high volume of patients where the process uh, to introduce data and to count um, uh, all the different data elements for the tally sheet is, um, is really time consuming. Additionally, as having this information enter in an individual way, there is the possibility uh, to do analysis for uh, this individual data and uh, make use of uh, offline analytics. Mm -hmm. uh, final conclusions uh, about all these years using this system is that bringing technology to the place where the data is generated is um, simplified all the process for data collection and is well accepted by the final users of the system. We can reduce manual steps and uh, this motivates a lot the people that need to collect data, um, recognizing that um, uh, data literacy is not so the priority from uh, in some cases related with the clinical priorities uh, that our colleagues face, face in, the, in the field. Um, some of the challenges that we encountered was the provision of technical support, the hardware management, digital skills of the people using the, the tablets, um, the robustness of the, of the app, and the loss of knowledge due to the high turning staff. However, now we think that we can implement this system in other places and having an add value for the use of data and uh, the use of the adoption of the system for our colleagues in the, in the field. Um, this is just one of the sentences from one of the people who participate in the, in the pilot. Um, and just from our side also, we need to thank um, our colleagues in the field that are in charge to collaborate and, and to uh, help us in this process to implement the, the pilot. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Jose. Do we have any questions? Okay, so I will have a side. Brenna, on this side. Brenna? He will touch. <laughs> So just speak into this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and pre presenting Mercyco. So um, about this uh, this automated mobile data collection, which you have just told, it's great and definitely it's a need of the time. But uh, I just wanted to know about that. How are you? validating the mechanism of data quality in this because this is something which we are also doing in Pakistan for quite some time because we get to have our field staff and we term them as TFS district field surveys and many a times uh, the data entry they do not match with a master file for instance duplicate entries and let's say if the TFS is having a bad day he's putting you know male to a female and female to male so you know these kind of input entries they are expected from them 
because they're working all day in day out in on the fields so how do you uh, really validate the mechanism of data quality and data integrity on this complete system i would really, really like to know about it thank you yes i would like to have the proper answer for this <laughs> But trying, uh, yes, and this is one of the problems that we face, not just in this project related to mobile data collection offline, but also in many of the different, in all the places where we work. So the process that we establish is a validation that is done at the project level is the um, project medical reference that should review and uh, validate the, the data, then also at uh, coordination level. Um, but it's true that, we can also implement some rules, but it's not the case in, in it's, it's always the, what we are using in this moment is manual review of the data, cross-checking what we can see first from, uh, from the dashboard that we have compared with the registry books and then also with files. Other question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, uh, Tomas Matas, WHO Geneva. I have just a quick question about the periodicity. How often did you enter the data? And, and for example, if it was daily, why it was daily, not weekly? And uh, if you can talk about this, thank you. Yes, the data are introduced in real time, let's say, at the moment that when uh, there is a patient that enter in the, um, in the service, they start introducing data. Uh, and then at the end of the day, they come with the tablets to the uh, base of the project to charge the tablets. And at the end of the, the, the week, the synchronization is done because the analysis of data is done in a weekly basis in this project. Hi, um, thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, did you have many instances where uh, patients were coming over and you couldn't find them in the database already and you had to go back to your uh, paper records to sort of, you know, find the client or did that not occur uh, very often? And if it did, what did you introduce in terms of a process to mitigate for that? Yes, I would like to say no. <laughs> <laughs> As there is always some, uh, there is a human part um, yes, the good thing of the system, and is one of the things that help us to uh, improve data quality, is that if we enter a patient, uh, then the patient is in the tablet. So if at a certain point we forget to introduce some additional information or information related with the exit of the patient, we, will, we can see because the exit indicators, as for example, the bed occupancy rate will increase. So it's, the, it's one of the ways that we have to detect any problem. So um, the issue to forget some data is fewer than the one that we have in other projects where everything is based on, on paper. Well, while we get the next question, I would add that uh, I think it's important in that sense to, to think of the purpose of the digitalization. So in this case, for the presentation, I see the purpose, and I know the purpose is to generate the, the, the routine information at the end of the week and not the clinical care, which happens with the clinical file. So it's like, if you can find the patient again, great. But if not, it's not, a, it's not the worst case scenario in this case. Uh, hi. Uh, I will, in the process of setting up the uh the pilot i i want to know uh what were the criteria for site selection uh for the project to be scalable in the future and what's the size of the hospitals you you are using and the size of the team or the the people working with the system how many tablets what can you elaborate about about that for us to think about scaling it up for the selection of the site perhaps Marta can tell you a bit more because she was involved in this process <laughs> I was involved in the beginning of the project <laughs> so the selection was um, as in other pilots we were looking for a place that was 
challenging, but also stable somehow. And, and this was a long-term intervention with, uh, it was English speaking. It has an, at that moment, I don't know nowadays, you can tell us average volume of patients that would stress a little bit the system, but not to the limit. So that was the, the selection from the top of my head. But currently, I don't know the situation, how it is. Yeah. Yes, for the implementation in other places, uh, there are many considerations to, um, to put on the table, uh, not just in relation to the data or the connectivity or even digital skills, but also other related with uh, high security context, the use of tablets in places where perhaps can put in danger some of our colleagues. Um, and we work mainly with, uh, in this moment, with uh, under demand. So there are other projects that are interested in implementing this, uh, but always considering competing priorities for the uh, at operational level. So things to, to consider. And I think that you also ask about the, the number of tablets. There is one in the each service. We are running five in this moment. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Paul Saunders, and I'm a leprosy specialist. Can I ask about the servers? So do you have your own DHS2 system that is dedicated to this program, or are you going into the whole national DHS2 program? Uh, because I'm I'm interested to know whether there are many separate systems in a country like South Sudan that may not have a very coordinated central government. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we use an independent server and data that are generated here in the projects, not just in South Sudan, but in the different projects and missions where we work are stored under uh, the HMIS, Health Information Management System from MSF Okba. So it's not directly shared with the at country level uh, in a daily or in a routine uh, base. But I would say this makes part of the reporting mechanisms that the organization has either with the health cluster or with the MOH. They are just getting the information from here. Yeah. It's not directly connected. But they report, like they share the information. Yeah. That's always Thank you. I'm working. My name is George. I'm working with the his center in Oslo. Sorry. Um, I have two questions. So on the third slide, or I think you had the register. I wonder whether you consider digitizing also the register to eliminate another paper-based tool. Mm -hmm. And the second question was that I'm not sure I understood correctly. So you use DHS2 as a platform. But did you use a native tracker program or did you actually build a customized app that is linked to DHIS2? I didn't understand that technical part. Thank you. Uh, in relation to the digitalization of the registry, registry book, uh, was proposed and suggested to the project, but final users request to keep having this book as a confident um, tool for them also. So there is this possibility to uh, directly introduce uh, data directly from the clinical file to the mobile data. But for them, it's also a way to uh, estimate number of beds to have their planning. So it's just because they request that it, it is possible. And perhaps for the technical part, I have two <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's a tracker program with a the full tracker, the full DHS to up. And, and it was a tracker program because the users, it was an event program at the beginning, but they wanted to search uh, patients. So that complicated a little bit the data protection aspects, <laughs> but yes. Max, do we have any question in the chat? Otherwise I think we move on to the next. Yeah, we don't have.
Thank you. So we are going to Yes. Okay, so we have our Oh, but he's going to share the screen. Yes, please. Okay, so you can share your screen. We have our third presenter which is Radwan Alpha K from USA GSI. It's gonna present a project for child, uptake of child vaccination at community level with mobile technology. So if you want to share your screen. Did you see my screen? We see it, but um, but not where we should see it. One second. Okay. Yes, we see your screen um, and okay. your slides. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, and uh, I'm Rodwal uh, Fabir from uh, uh, Yemen, uh, Sharp Project. Um, we are going to present our abstract uh, regarding to the increasing child vaccination uptake in Yemen through mob through pilot mobile notification system at the community level. Just we, we will give short brief about the overview uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Yemen regarding the situation of uh, uh, in general. Yemen remains vulnerable to disease outbreak including vaccinating preventable disease due to the risk of conflict there is also some displacement the displacement people from one government to another due to the war, as you know, and also recruiting natural disasters, depleting the country healthcare system and critical infra infrastructure. As the conflict uh, escalating, many families become less likely to the vaccinating their children because of the benefit driven health services are not urgent or tangible as food assistance and treatment of acute conditions. Challenges, uh, according to the last uh, report published by the UNICEF regarding to the vaccination, uh, it's, it's reported that Yemen has the most, the most under vaccinated children of all the countries in the Middle East and North Africa region. Almost a third of the population under the age of one year has missed road to him vaccination for the preventive disease. There are above one, 174,000 zero dose and, uh, and about uh, 9,700 under vaccinated children of one year. This means representing 80% and 10% of the total population of the under year children. Besides that, uh, Char Project conduct a study in 2021 uh, and vaccination rate in aiding government were lower, much lower than the other government where we are supporting these governments. Rumors and myths about vaccination persist lowering confidence in the child immunization. Also, we find that displacement of part of the population are also contributing to missed immunization. The paper regarding to the quality at the health facility level, we found that paper-based daily register result in poor data collection and quality, leading to insufficient contact and demographic information about vaccination children. This creates difficulties in contacting caregivers for further notification for their vaccination or for the next vaccination of their dose. Our intervention, the goal was, uh, the goal of the pilot study uh, is to test if the short ma message uh, surfaces. Reminder message can help to identify children who miss their vaccination appointment using the DHI2 tracker. In October 20, 2022, the USAID child project initiates a six month pilot project in El Proefa district in aiding government to test if the reminder message sent through mobile device could be effective in reaching those children with the immunization. 
Albrega was selected because for the reason that the vaccination rate was lower comparing to the other districts where we are supporting the three governors. This, uh, the system sent uh, SMS reminders to the parents or the, to the caregivers, notifying them of the next vaccination appointment dates of their children under 18 months. There is two messages sent. One, one message is welcoming uh, when, uh, at the start of the enrollment, and the other message is for the mind their vaccination. Mobile system or the tracker system. Char project characterizes the community health information system using Android application. Uh, DHIS to capture, as you we all know about this application, and let's a pilot electronic registry mobile. Uh, we customize this in Arabic language. DHIS to capture for the Android devices works with the DHIS to instance to capture the individual data related to the vaccination schedules. The AR or the uh, electronic registry of the organization strengthening the linkage between the community and the health facility, enabling the health facility to identify children who missed their vaccination appointment and share a list with the community midwife to follow up and to track the status of the children who vaccinated. The, here we, 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 uh, we show how the system is configured and uh, we we show in the right of the of the slide our uh, our platform using the HIS2 as as well as the DHIS2 tracker uh, which which show three programs is used in our community health information system. Uh, we are we we are the community midwife using the reproductive health uh, program as well as uh, uh, ear history as well as the health, uh, the child health. Sharp piloted this uh, AR, uh, AIR customizing the DHIS2 WHO digital package for the immunization registry with the configuration of the bulk SMS API to activate and schedule the notification SMS system using mobile application DHIS2 captures. We use this gateway uh, service provider, the bulk SMS in order to link the DHIS2 instance, and this in order to enabling sending the notification SMS. The end user training and launching the pilot uh, project. The, the project provides the end user training for 23 community midwives and, 80, uh, and eight health facility organization focal point. From that district, we were uh, supporting this AR pilot testing. Char also conducting a launch workshop for the pilot testing involving the central level of the Ministry of Public Health and Population, organization program, as well as the district health office. And also we invited the local part partners. Uh, community outreach, uh, the community midwife and the health facility organization focal point work together to mobilize those families for their next vaccination appointment. Also, we conduct a feedback workshop with those health facility focal point and the community midwives. They, and we, we, they reported that the families were, who received these SMS reminders were happy and they are encouraged and also this SMS message motivated them in order to reach the health facility to take for their children the, the, the vaccine. Here we show the results that we found during this pilot study. During the pilot testing period, the, the Pinta 3 vaccinate uptake increased by 41% from 23.8 in November uh, to 33.5 in March. Uh, if you if you look at the red line in the in the chart at the right, you will find in November that the, the value was 23.8 and in March increased it uh, 335. That means 
the improvement was about 41%. Also, we found that there is overlapping between the, the, uh, the blue line and the red line, which re uh, represent the PINTA 3 and the PINTA 1, which means that most of the children take uh, who, who receive the PINTA 1, those are taking the, the third dose. At the bottom, we, we are showing the, the calculation between the PINTA 3 and PINTA, uh, PINTA 1 and PINTA 3 drop rate, uh, which, which decreased from uh, 42 at October uh, when the enrollment started and decreased to 70% uh, at uh, March. The conclusion and the lesser live, uh, uh, the AR uh, application helps to, to strengthen the to strengthen the link between the community midwives as well as the between the community midwives and the health facility, enabling the health facility to identify the children who miss their vaccinating appointment and alert the community midwives. Also, we, we learned that active participation from the community midwife and their presence in the community plays a crucial role in increasing the child immunization, supplementing by the SMS reminder system to reach the, the caregivers. Even though in the areas with it, uh, where the telecommunication uh, has a problem, like the, the low coverage, the SMS reminder message link with the community health information system, enhancing the enhanced by the DHIS2, showing promise results by decreasing the drop rate in the children vaccinating program. As a solution to this challenge, caused by the busy phone network, Char, Char flexibly adjusted the time to send the SMS message to the client. This improved the reach by minimizing challenges with the network's problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions. Do we have any question here in the audience? We have one over there. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting to see how uh, um, immunization uptake has um, increased. But um, I would like to know um, what is the fraction of population in Yemen, at least in the in the governorates that you have um, um, used this system, who owns a phone, uh, how many households, just to know what fraction of the people are left out um, receiving an SMS. Um, yeah, yes, that, that due to that, to the war and the, you know, the infrastructure what collapse, especially the tele telecommunication uh, system. Uh, we, 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 we have only one, one service for, for provider for tele telecommunication. And also the SMS uh, notification reminder, it's not that the, uh, not, not all, all the, the, the parents receive. Uh, there is, there is maybe, uh, Seventy percent of the SMS received the, to that to that uh, uh, parents. Yes, but but we, we as a backup, we, we the community midwife also reaching these uh, these uh, children uh, who enroll and follow up uh, when when the when when the system notified the community midwife inside their phone to reach that that children. Uh, when, when, uh, as as a route as a routine, so we have two things to follow up for the vaccination. The SMS is a reminder. If it, if the SMS not reach, also the community midwife reach that house in order to inform or to uh, m uh, encourage those uh, uh, parents to take their, their children into that health facility. We have another question here in the audience. Yeah, as well. I kind of a continuation on that question is that what is the reading comprehension level 
in this country, in this governorate? And do you have you tried voice messages, possibly? A good question. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the, the, this this also one one of the idea has been provided to us during the feedback that uh, uh, we conducted uh, for both the community midwife and the health facility. They also advise us to include the voice message because some of some of the families are providing the land uh, the land phone uh, contacts. Uh, no, not all the, the families has mobile phone. So uh, it was challenged uh, to send uh, SMS message to that land, uh, land, land phone. So uh, this this one of the idea have been recorded and uh, documented uh, for the for the scale up plan. Thank you. I think we don't have uh, more questions here. There is one in the chat. Okay. Oh. So we have. Three questions in the chat. So I'm gonna read the first one because we have time. How did you obtain the phone numbers of the clients for follow-up? Do they provide the numbers who are coming to the health facilities? Yes, the, 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 the client uh, provide their phone numbers and it's uh, one of the mandatory uh, uh, attribute during the enrollment. Uh, the community midwife or the health facility focal point must fail it. If if they if if they didn't have, there sometimes the community midwife re, re, uh, report or enter uh, her phone numbers in order to notify her. And sometimes, uh, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, that some families provide la, land phone contact numbers, which uh, which give us some challenge to provide that SMS. Okay, and the second question is, was this intervention only for follow-up on those who missed follow-up appointments? For example, not for zero dose child or those who have not made contact with the health facility yet? I guess it follow-ups from the previous. Uh, as, as a start point, yes, it was only for these who missed the follow-up. But as a, and we, we make it as a backload, but currently it's continuous for any child who are wronged uh, for, for uh, immunization, they, uh, it's from the, the, the start point. So uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, in, in the, uh, it started like uh, to follow up for the missed children, but now it's for, 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 for general immunization. And the last question in the chat, uh, says that you mentioned a community health information system in your last slide. Could you describe that part of the system a bit? Is it based on some other tool? Is it the DHIS to capture app? Yes, uh, it's the DHIS to capture app, which includes three programs, reproductive health programs for the community uh, midwife, as well as uh, child health, and also including uh, the third one, which is the e registry. Uh, for, for this purpose. We have another question in the chat. We don't have any here, so I'll keep going with the online participants. Uh, this one is uh, for SMS reminder. I would like to understand how Yemen are sending SMS to people missing appointments within the HIS2. Currently, I heard that it is through a custom script. Do you have another way? Yes, uh, as, I, I, as I mentioned, we, we contract the bulk SMS service provider to provide as a gateway in order to send a message. So we link the, this gateway, bulk SMS, uh, this, uh, this company, it's a, a global company. We contract it and we provide as the, the gateway API and we link it with the DHIS2 in order to activate these schedules SMS. So we'll extend a little bit and then we have one comment here. Um, it is a native functionality of the HIS2 to send SMSs to the tracked entity instances if there is a phone number, if it is configured and with a gateway, which is exactly what um, what is being explained in the presentation. 
All right, one more. Um, one more from the room. Uh, I have no idea what kind of capacity or what utilization level you have in, in each clinic or health facility. Did, did this have an impact on, on the capacity of the, the clinics that received more patients after this? I, I understand that vaccination is kind of low effort, more or less, I mean, in, in the time spent since, but did you have any challenges based on that, given, given that you have 43% more patients on, on the load? Uh, you mean a patient in general, or your, your question as uh, talking about the children in humanization? Yeah, did you have more load and how did you handle that? The volume in the facility. Oh. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, actually, we are focusing for uh, the immunization children. I, th I think if, if I understood the question well, is that um, did the sending reminders with SMS increase the volume of patients in the facility? And if so, how did you manage? Uh, actually, actually uh, the, the, the ER application, capture application, uh, was helping the health facility to, to organize the profile of the children. So uh, the, 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 they are interesting of using this uh, uh, mobile application or the DHIS to capture because as we get it from their feedback. Uh, it's easy to uh, uh, search for uh, children in profile. Also, uh, they, they can uh, uh, found the, the tractor dose of the organization easily, uh, uh, despite that the way that in the daily register paper, uh, we, we find it it's more difficult uh, for them to, to, to give the history of that ch uh, children. So uh, the, the mobile application or the DHIS tracker uh, was uh, supporting the uh, health facility uh, in organizing and uh, uh, saving their offers and enabling them to effectively mon monitor the children in that, uh, doses. Okay, thank you. We don't have uh, more questions in the chat, neither in the room. So I think thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. If, if you can stop sharing your screen. Sure. We are going to move to our last presentation of the day. We are going to change of, of the session, not of the day. The perspective we are going to hear now from the person behind all these implementations. Uh, no, <laughs> Chase. <laughs> and um, yeah, setting up, maintaining, giving yes, support. Mostly maintaining and supporting. Okay. These days. Maintaining and supporting. Dealing with problems. Okay. <laughs> so all yours. Yes. How's everyone doing? It's a little sleepy in here after lunch, I think. Okay. Excellent. So, um, Cool. So the the title here, uh, Max. How do I see the notes? Title here is key decisions for mobile data collection. I'm not going to focus uh, solely on DHIS two, but just general data collection in an offline setting. That'll do, thanks. All right, so um, yeah, so we're all here today uh, for the common use of, as I said, collecting data with DHIS2. Uh, this session specifically, uh, one more question, Max. Is this the camera that I'm on? Because it's at my chest level, or is it that one? 
Okay. <laughs> Good father. I can't read my notes and be on the camera. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, we're all here for uh, collecting mobile data in an offline remote location. Um, so this topic is going to look very different for each of you, depending on whether you are uh, from the Ministry of Health, you're backed by a donor-funded project, you are a donor, um, or if you're a nonprofit or a consultant. Um, so your relationship to these challenges that we're going to discuss today will be completely different than someone else in this room. And those, those challenges um, are not exclusive, as I said, to DHIS2 or even the health sector. They're common issues that arise whenever we're implementing technology. Um, we've all run into issues, uh, but particularly when you're offline, things get more complicated, uh, exponentially more complicated. Um, they can be just as challenging too uh, in these locations when using pen and paper, uh, for those that of you have done it or doing hybrid sorts of things with pen and paper. So we use technology to find an advantage um, over traditional methods of data collection. Otherwise we would just stick with the paper registers that we all know and love. Um, so throughout my presentation today, please try and look and think about the advantages, the disadvantages and why we even use the technology in the first place. Uh, is it cost savings? Is it better data quality? Typically I think data qualities are, are like go-to um, or is it faster reporting? So on. So there's one prominent advantage uh, can also be a disadvantage, especially in our context. Um, it's always at the center of technology implementation and it's typically a major challenge for us. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit more interactive today. I know, like I said, it's a little sleepy in here, but um, does anyone know what typically the biggest constraint is for us in our projects? Fear of tech, that, that's a pretty good one. Okay, bias that you can't do it. I was thinking money. <laughs> um, so just remember that it's always a balance of trade-offs. Those are, were two great answers as well. Um, I know that technology literacy has increased in the past couple of years, decade. Um, everyone seems to have a smartphone these days, um, but I, I was thinking of money. And again, throughout this presentation, I also wanted to point out that we are living in the future. <laughs> so by that, I mean that we have very, very real technology now that is changing the landscape of remote data collection. Um, specifically, I'm thinking about Starlink. If anybody knows Starlink's uh, satellite web of internet um, providers, providing satellites. Uh, it's now available in Nigeria, Rwanda, Mozambique, very recently, and uh, much of South America. I think it's going to continue being adopted uh, as soon as regulatory bodies approve of it. That's really the only challenge left. Um, so again, I want to encourage you to think about the trade-offs between money, what's possible, uh, what's an advantage and what's a disadvantage. Um, so I'm not gonna have any groundbreaking thoughts or assertions today. I really just want to facilitate a conversation. Um, the goal is to spark that conversation, to continue beyond the conference. And if we get any good feedback or notes, um, is this being recorded, Max? Excellent. Uh, I'll try and do a write-up on the community of practice so that we can keep this going for a while um, because it's a lot to think about. No one's going to have the same uh, context on a project. Oh, I have a clicker. Great. Nope. Yeah. That was, um. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm there. Yep. I was changing the slides on the, on the Zoom call. <laughs> okay, so. I'm Chase Freeman, Solutions Engineering Manager at BAO Systems, and it's my job to create sustainable solutions. And my approach uh, in doing that is mostly collaboration and communication with those who can do things very well. Um, so I do this internally at BAO for my colleagues. I do it for our clients, uh, whether it's tracking down DHIS2 bugs, brainstorming effective workarounds until a patch comes through, or building custom applications uh, and working with teams to, to implement technology. Typically, it's always DHIS2 these days, because that's, that's what we do. Okay, so here's what we'll be talking about today. And please be prepared that my slides are very sparse um, as the titles, that's about as sparse as the titles. Um, but I'm hoping that you will engage with me a little bit and share your experience with some of the scenarios that we'll be talking about. Um, so to start off, I want to pull the room. All you have to do is raise your hand. Um, I will have some questions, so I don't know if You'll be getting a workout today with the microphones. But just for this one, if you could please raise your hand 
um, who has conducted an offline data collection program or campaign with zero to 25 devices? Anybody? Okay, a couple. Uh, anyone with 100 to 200 devices? Okay, we got one. Uh, so I'm assuming no one with 500, 1,000, 3,000 or more. Okay, cool. Interesting. Um, oh, clicker. So uh, I want to take a second before I get into all of this and promote the incredible work that the Android team and DHIS2 in general has done to document all the software. It's an incredible resource. And I want to point out that um, you should just always go here when you have questions first. Search the documentation, search the community of practice. The points that I'm raising, as I said, they're not unique. And in fact, most of them are right here in the documentation. Um, they've been thought about well, they've been tested, they're from the field. Um, so always go to the documentation. And I wanna say also that the Android web settings app and the new um, user troubleshooting workflow, is that what we call it, uh, is very incredible. That is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting um, that we need to help implement in the field and remote locations. Um, so that screenshot is just from the implementation docs for the Android app. Okay, so my first slide, as I said, quite sparse. I wanna talk about scaling. So it's a, an essential factor that impacts all aspects of our project planning and execution. And, and the strategies that work well for small pilot projects may not, um, actually do not translate effectively to larger countrywide implementations. We've got to deal with resource allocation. So large scale projects, uh, resources, we've got to deal with the human factor, technology, and the need to be deployed, or they all need to be deployed strategically to cater to the extensive and diverse needs of all the places that we, we go. Um, whether it's remote, um, well, we're, gonna, we're talking pretty much about anywhere offline, so consider it remote. Uh, data management. As the scale of a project increases, so does the complexity of the data management. The cost implications, I talked about money earlier. Uh, Large-scale implementations obviously are going to come with significant more costs. Risk mitigation, uh, potential risks and challenges multiply as well. And lastly, continuity and transition. So with larger projects, we need to ensure that the continuity of services um, are in place for smooth handovers and upgrades. And we, someone else was talking earlier about, uh, actually, I think two or th all three of the previous presentations talked about um, human resources and recruiting and hiring uh, and training uh, along the way. Keep forgetting I have the clicker. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier is that I'm not going to talk about SMS or um, training at all. That I figured that those would be two things that you'd have an entire session on. So we're gonna just avoid those topics entirely. So the logistics, um, I think most of you have seen a, a road like that uh, if you've been out in the field. So I wanna dive in a bit deeper and look at some of our key challenges. Mostly, uh, I think logistics is the biggest one. So here's a scenario. You're in an area with no internet. You need to upload records from a device. And this may require that that device be transported to a location uh, with internet. There's no magic way to upload something to the internet when there is no connection. So it needs to be transported somewhere or bring the internet to it. Um, and to do so, you can either do that as the data collector or you can give the device to someone else. So a few things to consider. Does the person who needs to transport the device have to leave their post or can it be given to someone? Does the data clerk or collector have another device to collect, continue collecting data after that device has been given to them to be uploaded? Um, and then who maintains the custody of the data and the device during this process? With aggregate data, you know, it's not so, uh, not as important to, to know that, but when you're dealing with um, sensitive data, PII, it's important to know who has physical control of that data. Uh, and then when the data collector gets to the place that has the internet, how is it going to be uploaded? Are they sharing accounts? Um, are the credentials in order for them to log in and upload the data with their own account? And are they qualified and trained to address any issues that may arise during data upload? These may seem like um, specific questions, but they happen. 
Um, so when addressing these concerns, it calls for a strategic approach. Uh, that's gonna be a common theme planning here. For secure data transport, you gotta make sure that the database is encrypted. If a tablet's traveling through the countryside, it could end up in many different places. That is a native feature in DHIS2. It can be toggled on and off on the Android devices. It should typically always be uh, toggled on. But there are trade-offs, as I discussed earlier. When you have encryption on the, on the device, uh, it could impact your performance in querying and searching. But again, we'll get into, uh, that always goes back to money, really. It's just a constraint with the device that you have. Um, so anyway, always encrypt the database. You never know where they're going to be. Um, so also for continuous data collection, as I mentioned, will the person who has to upload the device be traveling somewhere on their own? Will they give the device to someone else? How does that impact the data collection process? Are you going to have someone else with another device to continue collecting, or is it going to be a data collection period? Take a week off to, while you're traveling through the country, uh, and then you do reporting, and then you go back and collect more. Just, uh, again, food for thought. I don't have all the answers here. It's just scenarios. Um, so does anyone here have experience with something like this, where you have to travel to a, a internet cafe or a hub or anything like that, or handing your data data off to someone else to go upload. George. So you give the mobile, sorry, yeah, you give the mobile phone, you take it with you, give it to the pharmacist, they take the stock. And in the evening or next day, you give it back to the team. They go to an office and they synchronize it. Excellent. Sounds pretty efficient. So they have two phones? Or sorry, they go twice a day, you said? Yeah. I mean, in this case, you know, the stock count is done once a month. You leave it there overnight. And the next day or next evening, you, you take it back. Oh, OK. Well, that makes sense then. Okay. Sort of working in, in shifts. Anyone else have a similar experience? Sorry, I just add another one. Some yeah. because I think for the connectivity, I find it fascinating. You mentioned Starlink. We need to think out of the box because technology is moving fast. So there's also one uh, uh, NGO that has is actually uh, uh, featuring their vehicles with hmm. mobile Wi-Fi connected to a satellite, which is expensive. But think about it: if you had a car with a district health officer passing down this lonely road once a week, even once a month. And every, all the clinics could go out on the road and upload the data through the Wi-Fi to the satellite. It's just one idea. Maybe it's yeah. coming. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that could be, I'm not advocating for Starlink here. It's just kind of a popular thing. That could definitely be achieved using Starlink. Starlink is very expensive though. So let's not, you know, it's not going to solve everything. It's not going to fit into every project here. But that's, that's absolutely right. Another thing that um, at least we offer at BAO is um, a remote server. So you don't have to have the internet. You have a local network. Uh, you can at least upload all of your data there, visualize it in DHIS2, and if you want to connect it to a central server, then it still needs to be transported somehow. Um, that's the that's the setup. That's the setup that the MSF has. Oh yes, yes, I did know that actually. With, uh, <laughs> with DHIS2 servers yes. offline in the projects. Not through us, but no. yes, you guys do that very well. Um, okay, next slide. So I want to talk about constraints. Um, we've got uh, two main factors that come into play, software and hardware. That's, well, there's probably a lot of more constraints, but this is the two I'm going to talk about. So from a software perspective, the complexity of your program may limit the amount of data that can be collected offline. Uh, so how intricate are the data collection forms? How many calculated fields? Uh, these are the factors that influence the total data that you can get before having to offload or sync the device. On the hardware side, the device capacity, particularly RAM and storage, determines how much data it can hold, or process rather. But there's a balance to strike, always a balance to strike, and it's gonna come back to money, surprise. These hardware and software constraints need to be assessed against the project's budget and the specific needs. Um, so has anyone encountered the issue where you run out of space on your tablets or you cannot query 
uh, while trying to search for someone? Not yet, okay. <laughs> okay, so as we navigate these constraints, it becomes clear. Oh, I did want to point out, sorry. This is again from um, the wonderful documentation, Android implementation, great recommendations. Um, so as we navigate these constraints, it becomes clear that striking a balance between project needs, financial considerations, and technical capabilities is absolutely crucial. And it's completely varies depending on your use case and your location. So while we could theoretically invest heavily in advanced hardware, uh, you know, Starlink or remote servers, whatever it may be, um, this approach is often prohibitive in terms of cost. It's prohibitive in technological requirements, training uh, the capacity of your project and your staff, uh, and also security considerations. So instead we need to evaluate each of our project's unique needs um, and on the ground capabilities. We need a form and assessment so that we can identify happy medium that enables effective data collection and management without overshooting and overspending. So how am I doing on time? I think I have five minutes before questions. So yes. five, yes. okay. Uh, so metadata management, this is more, um, depends on the system that you use, you're using, but it's quite unique to DHIS2. And I want you to picture this scenario. You've identified an issue after testing, after you've deployed your application, you're in a remote area, um, perhaps an option set is missing, a valid option, um, or there's a glitch in a program rule or something like that. So the question now becomes, how do you make sure that this update, you know, you fix it and you're, you're all good to go, but how do you ensure that this update is seamlessly integrated into the device of all of your users? At five users, 10 users, that's somewhat manageable, you can call them all. But at a national level, when you have say 3,000 or 5,000 devices, the problem becomes much larger. Um, so communication systems are crucial. Um, all data collectors need to be notified of upcoming changes, prepared on what to expect, giving clear guidelines on how to ensure correcting or correct syncing on the devices. Again, at, at the scale of a thousand plus devices, if something goes wrong, you're gonna get a thousand calls one day. Um, so you need to I, you know, be ahead of that and send out messages. Have a, uh, I know one ministry at one point had set up a call center for these types of things when they were doing a pilot. Um, I also had seen mobile device management system used to uh, put out alerts and notices on everyone's tablets. Again, this was when they have connectivity, but at least a call center so you can travel to the nearest uh, place where you can make a call. I mean, I have internet, but at least a call. Um, so this scenario underscores the importance of robust metadata management strategies, which is good, whether you're online, offline, doing remote data collection or not. Uh, but in such cases, we need to diagnose the issues, push the necessary updates, and make sure that everybody is aware. I'm going to skip ahead. Okay, access control. This is a similar one. I only have a few short minutes left. So in a similar situation, when you need to make a push for metadata, uh, what if somebody forgets their password and they're offline? How, how do you manage um, that? <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's happened before. And well, you can use your thumbprint. In other cases, if, um, if somebody else needs to log in, Again, I would just say, make sure you have a communication channel to call a, a centralized support service, uh, whether it's through the ministry or it's your project or whatever it may be, uh, perhaps a, use a password manager, have a way to identify yourself in a, a secure manner over the phone, et cetera. But also most importantly, use the built-in uh, permissions and, and roles in DHIS2. Um, Okay, and my last slide here, managing Wi-Fi networks and the process of uploading data. Um, if you have, well, I, I have in the past had a team of 20 or so uh, data clerks, data collectors all show up to a hotspot and uh, need to upload their data for the day to finish their day and be done, done working. But you can't necessarily have all the bandwidth for everyone to upload all of their data at all the right times. So how do you manage that? Um, do you go to a, an internet cafe that costs money? 
Uh, do you have a hotspot? Do you use your phone? Uh, maybe hotspots are out of fashion now because all the phones can do it. But how do you manage the bandwidth? How do you manage access to a Wi-Fi network, sharing the password? Um, these are just questions that I'm, I'm posing. Um, there's no really great answer other than proper planning. Um, or you can spend money to make it convenient. So my conclusion here, um, we've walked through several challenges. There's potential solutions related to the implementation and management of remote offline data collection, which is inherent to last mile service delivery, um, especially with DHIS2. But always remember that it's the human factor. This is what I say, to my opinion, it's, it's the human factor, not the technology that makes uh, the most significant challenges, in my opinion. I think the technology is sound, technology works. Yes, there's issues, but they can be solved. But it's logistics, planning, and money that pose the biggest challenges to us. Those can be overcome with proper planning. Um, so as we wrap up, I'd like to hear any insights. Uh, we'll open up for questions. Um, but yeah, if you have any challenges, I'd love to hear them. Like I said, I want to follow up on the community of practice, keep this conversation going. And I hope this conversation has been fruitful. Thank you, Chase. Uh, very good tips and things to consider <laughs> if we are going to jump into the mobile yes. world. <laughs> so do we have any questions on the audience? Uh, Breno, Breno will give you the microphone. Just a quick question to you and to other members of the audience in that the sort of mobile implementation, implementations we've done, and this has been you know quite a few years ago now for me, but we found that MDMs were utterly essential. You know, it's easy to do a pilot with 50 tablets or something, mm -hmm. but if you're going up to 200 or 500, you cannot scale unless you've got something that really locks them down and helps you really quickly push out. You don't want to pull back 500 tablets and reinstall things. It's just not feasible. Right. But as far as I know, and I'd love it if anyone knows of one, there isn't a free and open source MDM out there yet. So I don't know if anyone's found anything that comes close, like a one that's actually cost effective enough, but we've ended up using MDMs that are like, you know, $40 a year or something, mm -hmm. US star, which is, okay, well, you've got donor funding, but it's not sustainable. And I, I think that's right. a real, incredibly important, but also a real challenge. I'd be really interested to hear if anyone else has had uh, good experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, the documentation has um, a really good chart of various MDM providers, their advantages, their pricing, things like that. The one that I have used the most is Mirador. I, I don't work for them. I'm not saying that you should use them. But the reason that we liked their model was because their pricing was somewhat sustainable. You could leave the software on a device and scale it from their free version, which was almost useless, but you could at least have it on the device, leave it there. And then when money came in, we were able to scale up to the full features or the features that we needed. So I think that uh, was the biggest feature for us. Um, I think the biggest need as well for MDM stemmed from having to manage the versions of DHIS2, which we can now do. Uh, I forget what it's called, it's so new. APK distribution. The APK distribution app. So I think that's gonna be a big game changer, but for security and just tracking of, of assets, when you've got thousands of tablets, I don't know how else to do it without an MDM. So I agree with you. Um, I did wanna say as well, I made a note, cause I forgot to put it in my slide, is that anyone that is going to procure, say more than 20 tablets, cause it's a it's a pain to, to install everything. Um, well, I don't know if they'll do it for 20 tablets, but at the thousand tablet level or beyond, at least Samsung will preload the tablets for you with an MDM or the APK of your choice so that you, they ship with it. So you don't have to go through and set up a Google account and blah, 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 a thousand times. Um, so that is my biggest tip um, for you. And they'll, they'll typically work with like a local distributor, at least in Ghana, they had a Samsung uh, provider. So they came from Korea straight to Ghana loaded with, um, MDM and the DHS2 APK. That, that would save a ton of time. All you had to do was charge the tablets and they were ready to go. Um, yeah. George. Yeah, I'll comment more than a question. So uh, I'm George from uh, His Center, UIO working on LMIS. So you said that satellite communications is prohibitively expensive. I agree. I just want to add today it is. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if 10 years ago people would be watching HD 
uh, TV movies on the subway. Today they are. <laughs> And uh, it, I, nobody could have afforded it 10 years ago. I don't know mm -hmm. the time scale. So I think that we have been promised that these low Earth orbit satellites, uh, we're hearing about it since 10, 15 years. So it might not happen. But mm -hmm. in five years or in 10 years, the cost might be really low. And maybe, you know, the humanitarians get together and they have a good package for all the HMIS data. And it takes many years to digitize the, the last mile. What if in five, six, seven years, it's affordable, but we are not ready. It will take mm -hmm. us five years to catch up. So I think we don't have to jump on it today, but we should be ready and plan and watch it. And if it's coming so that if in five years, it's affordable, we are ready at least for, for some projects. Thank you. Very good points indeed. Anyone else online? They weren't. I don't think so. No. Nothing. No, these are from the previous. <laughs> yes. So um, about the MDM uh, question, Sam, we, we also did. We, we were extensively looking for providing solutions when we built the documentation and there was no full uh, open source mm -hmm. solution. There are some that are part parts or, or mm -hmm. certain things others that are willing to make agreements but you know where that ends <laughs> so so hopefully uh, we soon have something i mean we are what we are doing and is try to provide the most basic ones but obviously not to become an mdm provider but... <laughs> who said why not you <laughs> because we don't have time <laughs> <laughs> We need more team. Oh, yes, the community. I mean, please. There is a question over there. Hi, I'm uh, Gary from the M Supply Foundation. Um, we we make M Supply, uh, which is a, an ELMIS. Um, and just to add to the MDM thing, we also have not found there's no free open source uh, MDM yeah. solution. But the only thing we've been able to do because of scale in 40 plus countries. Uh, we've been able to drive the price right down um, mm. because we stick to the same supplier all the time. So maybe that's a, I don't know where that's a potential solution. Um, always using the same one has enabled us to drive the price right down for that. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yep. Okay, we have, uh, we are five minutes ahead, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I don't know about you, I'm freezing cold. So we can leave it here, but before closing, I want to thank our four presenters for sharing their amazing work and projects. And since you came to this session, I guess there is some interest on Android. So I just want to, or offline. So I just want to remind that we are going to be today and tomorrow in the experts launch at five. Uh, if you have specific questions, current challenges, ideas to share, please join the experts launch. And then tomorrow there is a session at 1 p.m. on uh, the Android web apps. So that's the big uh, unknown part of Android, which is that you can support your implementations through three web apps. We are going to present the web apps and explain you what can you do with all of them. One of them is the APK distribution, but there are two more. Or yeah, one is a bit specific, but yes. And and I think I'm thinking now, uh, and I'm gonna tell. Jose and Marcos, one part of that session can be also collect ideas. How could we expand those apps, those web apps for the use cases? So if you are interested, please join those sessions. And, and, and I think we'll leave it here. Thank you very much.